be seated. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you. I was thinking of singing that song. It's something I heard this morning on a um, podcast of another a sermon um, about God is never late, but He's seldom early. And um, so I've been kind of running that through my brain through the morning. Um, and just that song just kind of brought it uh, to the forefront again in my mind. This morning we continue our series through the Sermon on the Mount. We're continuing to look at Jesus um, describing uh, the type of people that he is going to be developing, the kind of people that will share his identity, the kind of people that will uh, represent him to a world that needs to see the light. And so um, we continue to move through Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And um, as you look at your bullets and today, you see not only the, the title, the text, but also some points that we will be uh, looking at today as we move through this text together. Years ago in California, there were 600 lawyer hopefuls that were taking the state bar exam at the Pasadena Convention Center when a 50-year-old man taking the test suffered a heart attack and needed medical attention. Two of the 600 test takers took the time to help the man, John Leslie and Eunice Morgan, and they administered CPR to this man until um, the paramedics arrived and once they took him away to the hospital, then these two uh, stepped away from helping this man and went back to finishing the test. But the problem was they didn't have enough time to finish in the allotted time that was given. In reciting test policy, the test supervisor um, said that uh, they could not make up time. They didn't get any extended time to finish this exam. In fact, the State Bar Office of Admission backed the decision at that particular time, stating if these two want to be lawyers, they should learn a lesson about priorities. Yeah, you have the response I had. <clears throat> This was immediately picked up by the papers in the San Francisco Bay Area and it created such an outcry to the state bar that they eventually had to relent, change their mind, and allow the two to take the test over again. Priorities. Priorities. You know, I think we all struggle to keep a proper perspective on what truly matters in life and and I think Jesus certainly understood this. He understood the battle that we would be a part of. He knew what would plague us throughout our lifetimes. And a lot of these topics are being discussed in this sermon. Some very core issues of life. Things that make us tick. Things that, that uh, are going to be a struggle. Things that we need to overcome. And we need to overcome with His help. And there's no other way that happens. You know, things that we can see and touch and taste and smell and hold and buy and sell and accumulate tend to demand a prior, priority status with us. And certainly money and our possessions consume our time and our attention to such a degree that it often replaces God as the object of our worship. In Ephesians 5.5 5, we read, You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of God, of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. I don't know many Christians that would say that this was their goal to make greed and, and wealth and possessions and money some kind of a God. But often that's what happens. 
And Jesus knew that our wallets and our checkbooks and our bank accounts and our investments and our closets and our garages and our rented storage spaces are the best barometers of really what's important to us. It's not so much what we would say, but it certainly is what's kept by us, what's protected by us. I think even Christians drift into adopting the, the world's priorities as our own. Not intentionally, but everything else in life is moving us and pushing us that direction. And if our focus and attention is not on Jesus and those things that, that He calls us to, then that's the natural thing that's going to happen. In part, Jesus' emphasis in the section of the Sermon on the Mount that we're looking at today warns the genuine disciple to refrain from adopting the world's standards. The things of the world are changing. They're eroding. They're constantly losing their value. On the other hand, matters to which Jesus referred to as treasure in heaven is steadily increasing in value. You've heard the word, as I have, materialism. We know that materialism is an out-of-balance preoccupation with what we possess. And this very thing has brought a lot of damage to men, to women, and our culture. This area of sin is not as obvious all the time as, as lust or as pride. In some ways, it's easier to hide in our affluent culture and has become almost acceptable to a certain degree for any Christian. Materialism, though, involves greed and envy, and these are two things that we find consistently through the Old Testament and the New Testament we are told to avoid at all costs. In my years of ministry, I have had people confess a lot of addictions to me over time. I've heard people confess that they're addicted to alcohol or they're addicted to drugs or they're addicted to pornography or they have stolen things from companies that they worked for. But I have never had a person broken heartedly confess to me, I'm a greedy person. Not once. Not once. You know, with this sin, there almost seems to be a type of a sliding scale. You know, we think that different rules apply to different people here. We've kind of accepted a, a relative system of deciding whether somebody is materialistic or not. And I think that kind of makes it a little harder to recognize and to see. And it's almost an acceptable sin for the Christian as long as he or she isn't obviously making bad choices or... or other people aren't hurt by those decisions. And if so, then that's kind of their issue. But that's why it's so deadly. It does its work in the hearts and souls of people. And it does nothing but pull us away from a true loyalty and commitment to Jesus Christ. As we continue our study of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will address this issue head on as he does with all issues. And once again, he will elevate the standard for those who choose to follow him. I'm using an outline again on the back of your bulletin this morning. The first part is that Jesus begins with the heart when talking about possessions. He begins with the heart. Mark Moore in his book, book, The Chronological Life of Jesus, says that in the first century, wealth was not accumulated in bank accounts. Instead, precious metals or expensive wardrobes and tapestries were accumulated. They were where wealth was found in individuals. It's where it was stored and contained within these types of items. And that's why in the text, Jesus reminds his listeners of what moths can do to cloth and what rust can do to metals. 
Let's look at what he says beginning in verse 19 of Matthew 6. Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus so much wanted his followers to understand that worldly riches are a poor investment. Moths can damage these expensive clothing and tapestries and thieves can remove them. You know, no moth-proof tapestries existed in the time of Jesus. There were no treatment processes and evidence at that time that were available to keep insects from eating at these treasured materials, ruining their beauty and reducing their worth. And so this was an issue that people readily understood in that particular day and time. And no minted coins of the day were exempt from rust or corrosion. No one could offer a guarantee that deterioration or theft wouldn't occur. No foolproof vaults existed in Jesus' day. And most people kept their valuables, whatever they had, in their homes. And the walls of their homes in that day provided very little protection. For the most part, they were made of dirt. And thus a person easily could dig through the walls of homes or businesses. And this happened often. The Greek word Jesus used translated break in could be rendered dig through and steal. Because that's what happened. And for these people that Jesus was first of all addressing that had staked their future in earthly possessions, he wants them to understand that this plan is not a good one. That these things that you're sinking your security in now and in the future, there's so many things that could happen to those. They could be eaten up, they could be stolen, they could rot, they could rust. And all this value you see in these will be gone. So this is not a this is not an intelligent plan. This is not a course of action anyone should follow. And today, yeah, we don't have these same problems. But what investments and what securities do we have that are fully secure? One of Satan's deceptions is to get us to settle for things short of what God has in mind. To get us intrigued with something down here that's more easily reached, but God has something up here of so much greater value and worth that He wants us to reach with more effort. I love what John Piper wrote in his book, Desiring God. He said, all the evils in the world come not because our desires for happiness are too strong, but because they are so weak that we settle for fleeting pleasures that do not satisfy our deepest souls, but in the end destroy them. The root of the evil is that we are the kind of people who settle for the love of money instead of the love for God. You see, that's not just a temptation for people that don't believe in Jesus. That's a temptation for those of us who do. And we feel the pull and the draw of the love of money and the satisfaction that it can bring. And if we just had a little more and a little more, we feel more secure and we could buy this and we could buy that. And it can become for us a God without us even realizing. 
But Satan also loves to see this statement repeated. Money is the root of all evil. Money is the root of all evil. Have you heard people quote that? Well, you know the Bible never said that. The Bible says it's the love of money. That's the root of all evil, not money itself. But how Satan loves to twist, take away, add. He's been doing it since Genesis 3. Paul mentors Timothy, his young apprentice, with this sobering warning. Paul wrote, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, Flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Paul said, Timothy, run. Run as fast as you can away from this. Its tentacles will be reaching towards you. You will be flavored. You will be drawn. Run, Timothy. Run. You know, we've all been reminded of the uncertainty of the stock market and the, the uncertainty of our retirement plans. A lot of you were looking at your investments about 10 years ago when the stock market took a major, major plunge. And maybe you've never quite recovered from that. My parents went through that. I'm sure many of you did as well, and it was very upsetting. Proverbs 23, 5 says, Cast but a glance at riches and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. So Jesus is saying, don't, don't put all your hopes in this. Don't put your security there. Don't build your life around these things. Instead, lay up treasure. Store up treasure in heaven. And, and how exactly do we do that? Well, you know, all the words in the Sermon on the Mount up to this point help define treasure in heaven. The very things that we've been talking about as Jesus works through the Sermon on the Mount and lays out the, the groundwork of the character of his people, the identity of his people, include all many things that, that bring treasure in heaven. Things like the development of Christ-like character and, and behavior, practicing righteousness so that God gets the glory, obeying Jesus' commands, giving generously, praying sincerely, fasting with the right motives. You see, all of these things that line up our lives with the call of God, those are things that create treasure in heaven. And it all comes back to what really drives you and what really consumes you. People devote themselves to what is truly most important to them. Or as Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Secondly, on your outline, what you choose to focus on Set your life direction. What you see and what you look at shapes your heart. And your heart is then seen in your eyes. Jesus talks about this often through the New Testament. But he said it this way in our text beginning in verse 22. He said, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? 
You see, what we see through our eyes shapes our heart and then our eyes reflect our hearts. You see, it's not just a, a lust for a person that starts with the eyes. It's also when you and I see something that we think we've just got to have. It may not be something we need. Most of the time it's not. It's just something we got to have. Why? Because we don't have it. Because we immediately begin to think of all the things that, that, that we could use if we just had this or, or how we would appear if we just had this or how much easier our life would be if we just had this. So, you know, it's so easy to rationalize the wanting of a possession. And it starts with the eyes. It's just a greedy desire to possess something you know, there's commandments after commandments in the Bible dealing with greed and covetousness and envy because God is so intent on getting the warning out to people, the dangers of this. And we are constantly being tugged and, and pulled with advertisements. If we would just buy what they're selling, our lives would be easier, we'd have more fun, we'd be happier, you know, our kids would be happier, every one of our gatherings would be the greatest joyful experience, and our, you know, we would just be so content. And here in the U.S. ad agencies and marketers try to dictate our focus. They try to focus us toward what they say is the ideal. But over time, we realize that the target of materialism is always moving. You know, once you get this, guess what? There's something else. And once you get that, there's something else. And it, the target keeps moving. And you never really reach it. And so dangerous. Arthur Randy Alcorn writes, we ought to periodically take our kids to the junkyard to let them see what happens to the material things that people long for. These things which were so important to people 10 years ago are now wasting away in a junkyard. Everything the world has is temporary. Don't you have some of those things in your house that at one time you thought you just had to have? And you haven't picked it up for 15 years or 10. And you forget you even have it. It's in your attic, it's in your closet, it's in your garage, it's in your basement, it's in the back bedroom. We all have those things. And it should remind us when we think about it that those things we just got to have, do we really need them? Is it the best use of what we have? Does it reflect a heart that's devoted to Christ? It's a heart devoted to materialism. You know, we need to make sure our eyes are focused on the Lord. Hebrews 12, 2 said, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. As always, we are the kings and queens of rationalization. Somebody catches us looking at something longingly, we might jump back and say, oh, I'm just window shopping. I'm not buying. I'm just, I'm just looking. I just enjoy looking. You know, that might sound good. It might sound like, yeah, we're not really gripped by that item. But you know, in our hearts, sometimes we're not really being truthful. We want that. We just don't want to look like we do. But you know, if you're not careful, someday what you're looking at will grab your heart. And it'll move from here to here. And we can say we're not attracted to the trappings of this world, but we'll find that whatever captures the attention of our eyes in time will magnetically draw us to it until it's in our heart. You see, whether you dive into materialism or you inch toward it, you end up in the same place. It's just Satan likes the slow, little steps that you just don't see what's happening to you until your heart is caught. John wrote about this battle 
in one of his letters. He said, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and, and pride and achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. It's so important to commit. Emphasis on commit to a personal relationship with Jesus and keep a single-minded focus on Him because if we don't, we are so sucked into all this stuff going on in the world around us, getting pulled and tugged and gathering up things that are really more important to us than they ought to be. Jesus becomes the counter. The one who gives us perspective to see what's really trying to be pulled off on us. Lastly, hold tightly to the right things. Hold tightly to the right things. This question came to mind as I was thinking about this passage this week. Good question for all of us to answer. What in your life are you gripping tighter than you should? What in your life are you gripping tighter than you should? What possession would you find hard to let go of that you would protect vigorously? That you might actually turn on somebody trying to take it away from you if you thought this was a real threat? Do you have things like that in your life? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The King James Version mentioned, which I'm sure a lot of us heard growing up, you can't serve both God and mammon. And mammon's really a, an Arabic word for really everything you own. Your money, whatever you accumulate, your possessions, your home, if you have any animals. It's pretty much everything. And Jesus is letting us know as he says these words that <laughs> you're going to serve one or the other. You're either serving God or you're going to serve your possessions. Somebody is going to get the short end of the stick. When you try to serve two masters, it's not a tie. Someone is going to take the lead. You're going to reach points where you've got to make a choice. Which is more important to you? Is it God or is it this? Is it your commitment to God or is it this? And when it's something else, when you're answering in a greater way to that, You've said who your Lord is. And so do I. Many of us don't realize how tightly we are holding on to something besides God. I was reading about a commuter flight from Portland, Maine to Boston many, many years ago. And the, the pilot heard a very unusual sound coming from the, the rear of the aircraft. And so Henry Dempsey began... He, uh, he turned the controls over to a co-pilot and moved through and began to head to the back of the plane to find out what was making the noise. And as he reached the tail section, he realized what was making the noise. The, the door back there in that section had not been properly closed and it was making a sound as they, they flew through the air. And so he realized he needed to do something about that. He grabbed the door handle and at that moment the, the plane hit an air pocket and threw him against the door and he was pulled out of the plane. And of course the co-pilot who's up front flying the plane, he notices the red light coming on that says, you know, a door is open. He's assumed that the pilot's falling out. He's radioing the, the nearest airport that they might send out a search helicopter and begin looking for this pilot. 
and he decided to make an emergency landing this co-pilot and, and, and pulled in quickly to the nearest airport that he could land the plane. And after he landed, the ground crew found Dempsey, the pilot, hanging on to an outside ladder by the door he had fallen out of. He had held on to this ladder for 10 minutes it speeds around 200 miles per hour at an altitude of 4,000 feet. And when the plane touched down on the runway, he had only 12 inches clearance between his head and the runway. And according to news reports, it took airport personnel several minutes to pry his fingers from that ladder. I understand that. But you know, some people hang on to money and the things of this world as tightly as Henry Dempsey was hanging on to that ladder. You know, maybe on a personal level, your entire life has been in the acquisition mode rather than the relinquishing mode. You've been in accumulating, protecting, saving, very little, letting go, letting others have. Which better describes you? Acquisition or relinquishing? Whatever owns you is what you will serve. We've probably all heard the quote from Zwingli, the theologian from hundreds of years ago that said, if you possess something you're not willing to part with, you do not possess it, it possesses you. It's important as Christians that we hold ever tightly to the things of God and loosely to the things of this world. Would you pray with me? Thanks, Father, today for challenging us. I think most of us have read this passage many times. We've been in classes and lessons and we've learned the, the head knowledge associated with possessions. We know where their importance needs to be and what needs to be first. But is that what we practice? Can this be a point of evaluation for us, honest evaluation, to really look at what's most important to us? What things in life are we holding on too tightly to? That's not Jesus. And I just pray for the bulk of us here today that this could be an honest time of evaluation whatever changes need to be made will be made today. And I pray, Father, for those who are sitting here today or listening on Facebook today. They maybe they have come to realize that the things of life are truly empty. There is really no great satisfaction in the accumulation of things, positions, Metals, paper on the wall, the type of house we live in, the type of car we drive. If those things don't really fulfill us in the way we thought they would. And we continue to reach out for whatever it is that's meaningful and we're just not finding it. Help us to see today through all the fog that Satan surrounds us with that it's Jesus. That the greatest things of life, the greatest joys, the greatest meaning, the greatest purpose, the greatest priority is seen in the things only He offers. Because it has eternity marked all over it. So, Father, I thank you that the gift of Jesus is offered to us so freely. When it 
cost so much. But we thank you for the love and mercy and grace that makes Jesus available to give us a new beginning, a cleansing of all sin, a new sense of purpose, an eternal one. And then everything else can go to its proper place. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning it's important to realize we that we serve a God who is always reaching out to you and to me. That he hasn't got mad at us and turned his back on us and walked away from us. If anybody turned away and walked away, it was us. And he reaches out to us with his hands and his arms and a loving heart and eyes that just simply say, come home. Come home. So today I just pray that if you've never given your life to Jesus, that you would be willing to come and talk to one of us with the badges on today and just say, hey, I've never made a commitment to Jesus. What, what does that involve? What do, I, what do I need to do? Maybe you're someone that's kind of been away from the Lord and you're looking to reconnect. And maybe you're ready for something different than you've ever experienced in your life. You're ready for more. You want to talk about that today. Maybe you just need to pray with somebody today. Yeah, I'm just struggling with something or, or there's something going on in my family or something with a friend or, or, or something at work. I just, I need some help. Please happy to pray with you today we just ask these things that you would respond to the arms of God who reached out to you today we're going to be standing together and singing feel free to move to one of us as you feel like you're led to do today or even following the service today as we stand together and as we sing